Sports is a deeply rooted part of popular culture in countries all around the world. From big games like the Super Bowl to tournaments like the NCAA Final Four, sports has a way of bringing us together and creating new tribes, like a few things in our culture. From post-game pizza outings and Little League baseball to grabbing a brew with your friends at a neighborhood sports bar, sports is a popular backdrop for human connection, bonding, and community building. That's all changing in the face of COVID-19. Welcome to Pop Life, I'm Joe Lee, here to discuss what it all means for the sports that we love and how it impacts the fan experience is legendary award-winning sports broadcaster Ian Eagle, WAER and Syracuse University alumnus and good friend. Welcome to Pop Life, Ian Bird. Joe, my pleasure. Great to be on with you. You've reached, you've reached the, the big time. This is the pinnacle of your career, being on Pop Life. <laughs> yeah. I, when I, as a child, dreamed of all the things that I might achieve, my parents said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be on Pop Life, Mom and Dad. <laughs> That's the goal. And now I get to realize it. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> so you are currently in the NBA bubble. So what's that, how, what's that experience like? It's been interesting. I, I'm part of almost like the diet bubble, auxiliary bubble. There are different zones here with the NBA. So the players, the coaches officials, staff members are in a green zone and they're located on one of three Disney properties. Mm -hmm. And now that they've all cleared quarantine, they can mix among one another and there can be interaction. I am in the yellow zone, which is a hotel about 10 minutes outside of the venue. And yes, we are tested twice a week. We are not permitted to integrate with anybody in the green zone. So during my stay here in the bubble, I will not see a player. I will not see a coach. I will not have any interaction with a staff member or official. I can just be around people in the yellow zone. And even that is very limited. They do not want you to have dinner. They don't want you to congregate. So basically, uh, Joe, I, I was built for this. I prep, I take a walk, I eat, I stream some videos, and then I rinse, and then I repeat. Uh -huh. That has been my routine. Wow. So, but you still have access to players and coaches just when you get to their particular bubble. I mean, how do you, you normally, you guys are doing pregame prep, you're meeting mm -hmm. with players and coaches, uh, getting ready for the broadcast, gathering all your information. Is that stuff still going on? No, it is not. The, the only access we have is via Zoom or via whatever uh, social virtual connection that we all have. So we did uh, two coaches interviews prior to our first game, New Orleans against Utah. We had Alvin Gentry on the phone on a conference call. We had Quinn Snyder on a Zoom. And each team will choose which vehicle they want to use. Uh, to be honest, Joe, we don't have a production meeting. We do it via some kind of uh, virtual social connection. It's very different. Mm -hmm. uh, wear a mask going up to our broadcast area. Our area is separated by plexiglass. So my partner and I are next to one another, but there is a large, thick plexiglass between us. I wore cologne for the first broadcast. I have no idea why. <laughs> Who would benefit from my odor? Nobody. So I, I think I miscalculated bringing the cologne down to Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, what experts are saying that even if a, or even when, I should say, a, um, uh, you know, a, uh, something is developed to, to deal with, with COVID, uh, that it may be for that particular strain. This, this is yep. going to be with us uh, probably for quite a while. Um, do you see this as the new path forward in your industry? Um, this, this kind of, maybe not to this degree, but this kind of uh, special treatment when you are engaging? I do. Uh, I think for the foreseeable future, there are going to be a lot of regulations on 
how we set up a broadcast area, where we broadcast from. Uh, I'm one of only four play-by-play announcers that are currently in Orlando for this stage of the season. Mm -hmm. And then all the play-by-play announcers around the NBA television and radio on a local level are doing it from a studio Mm -hmm. or from their home arena. And they're setting it up as if they were doing a normal game, but they're calling it off a monitor. I did a few of those before I made my way down to Orlando with the Brooklyn Nets. And of course, it's not the same. It's detached. Mm -hmm. You're missing out on the nuance. Mm -hmm. And even in the arena, Joe, I'm not courtside. We're about 15 rows up. And not only plexiglass between me and my broadcast partner, plexiglass in front of me. Wow. They are not taking any chances. They are leaving uh, no stones unturned. Uh, The NBA has been incredibly vigilant and respectful of the players and coaches and staff members' safety. And when the league announced their plan, I think there was skepticism. Mm -hmm. They made their initial announcement in May. And at that point, what was happening in our country, a lot of people thought, well, that's an overreaction. And the reality is here we are today, and it's not. It's very appropriate, and they have by far been ahead of the curve in doing everything possible Mm -hmm. to make sure that the players are in a safe and healthy environment. Let's talk for a second about that fan experience or the lack of fans in the stands um, with the broadcast. As a broadcaster, do you feel more pressure to bring something more yeah. to the game? Uh, as a broadcaster, do you feed off of fan reaction? Uh, sure, I-, I do. Fans are normally the compass that you use as a play-by-play announcer, when to ratchet up your call, when to pull back on television, when you get great reaction shots and pictures and this cascade of, of fans applauding that's often a sign for you to just stop talking. Let the pictures Mm -hmm. tell the story. Let the sounds tell the story. I have an advantage maybe that some others did not have, and I look at it threefold. One, I've called a number of games from a remote location, and big games, NBA Finals for the World Feed. I've done FIBA World Basketball Championships. I've done tennis events, golf events not being at the event, either being in a studio or being in a trailer. So I had a gauge of what the energy level had to be. Two, I've been the voice of video games for a number of years. And you think, well, what's the connection there? Well, you're in a sterile environment. You have to visualize what it is that you're calling. And then you have to find the right energy level and do it over and over again. I I did it for Sony PlayStation, PSP. I did a game in recent years called NBA Playgrounds. And you have to generate all the juice. And then the third advantage that I would say I've had is, Joe, I called New Jersey Nets games in the Mm mid-90s. There were not many fans there. (laughs) (laughs) Whoa, that's great experience. (laughs) Excellent uh, real life reps that I got early in my broadcast career with the NBA. That is great experience. uh, Many companies see uh, work from home as a reality going forward, even after a vaccine is developed. Yeah. Uh, it's the new way of doing business. Do you think this is going to redefine broadcasting, um, at least sports broadcasting? you think there will be more of the remote broadcast uh, in your future? Yeah, Joe, I, I think it is going to certainly streamline things. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've seen more of a skeleton staff for a lot of these live events. CBS has been doing golf, and they've been doing it quite well, week in and week out. I think to viewers, it feels like the normal broadcast Mm -hmm. but they're doing it with less people in the truck less people out on the course covering it less tape operators less audio people less announcers on site and I think the other part too which is really an interesting conversation I think based on so many of the circumstances that we've faced our normal standard has been lowered. 
-hmm. And I'm not saying that as a bad thing. It's just par for the course. Mm -hmm. What used to be considered acceptable on radio and television, we've now lowered the bar. Yeah. I know for you, Joe, you've been in this business a long time. Things, your ear is finely tuned. Mm -hmm. And if you heard something that wasn't correct under normal circumstances, you might pick up the phone and say, hey, what are we doing here? Right. That's got to be better. And now you might say, okay, I get it. We're doing right. it remotely or we couldn't get the best sound. The videos and were freezing up. And yeah, video. so now on, on, let's say, morning shows, if you were a guest on the Today Show, they would send a mobile broadcast unit to your home. They would set up in your driveway at five in the morning with a satellite. They would have an audio person. They'd have a lighting person. They'd have one or two camera people in your house mm -hmm. for your three minute hit at 730 in the morning. And now it's, do you have a computer? Mm -hmm. Can you turn it on? Do you understand how to hit a link? Uh, maybe they might ask you, oh, could you get in better lighting? Uh, could you move the mic closer? But could we've, you clean your kitchen? Yeah, could you clean your kitchen? Your <laughs> den's a little messy. Your kid is running in the background. Your dog just jumped in front of the shot. <laughs> you have something on your face. Everything has changed. So how long this lasts? I, I think the audience has accepted it. But what I've noticed, even coming back for the NBA, it's muscle memory mm -hmm. and people do have a certain expectation that comes with the coverage. And I think why the NBA on opening night was so successful is that they made it look and they made it sound like a normal NBA game. It yeah. didn't feel that unfamiliar. And the fact mm -hmm. is with the NBA, Joe, fans are as not a big a part of the whole equation as it might be for baseball mm -hmm. your main shot as a television director for baseball is the center field camera mm -hmm. and what are you showing you're showing the pitcher you're showing the batter the catcher the umpire and the fans yeah. behind them it's been ingrained in your brain right. to see fans to see some kind of action behind the action of the game same now, thing for football too football yes yeah. that, that you would yeah. see basketball other than the back of heads in the front mm -hmm. row and maybe a few faces here and there i think what the nba has done they've tightened it up mm -hmm. a bit and they've provided a track a soundtrack that makes you comfortable mm -hmm. i was up in the air as to uh, how i felt when it was announced that there might be fake crowd noise used because my initial instinct was hey, we, we should not be misleading the audience. We should not be pumping in something artificial. Our job is still to report mm -hmm. and our job is to be accurate. But when you've heard some of the sporting events that were completely flat mm -hmm. and uncomfortable for the viewer or listener, it did flip a switch in my head that maybe we, we do need to address it. So yeah. I'm a little, I've, seen, I've seen the NBA do what I thought was a, a highly credible job in their presentation. Yeah, I, I'm a little used to it because I'm a uh, Premier League soccer fan. That's one of the first That's uh, right. sports that I was able to watch live after uh, during COVID and, and they were pumping in sound and I, and I enjoyed it. I will say from a fan's perspective uh, last night, uh, watching the, the, the Lakers and Clippers, the energy between the two teams, um, it almost felt like a playoff atmosphere. Um, the excellent announcing from, um, from uh, Kevin Harlan, yep. um, it, it, it didn't detract. I didn't miss the fan and, and the, the, the piped in audio. I didn't miss much. I, was, I, I watched that game from beginning to end with the same energy and excitement all the way yep. through. That's my perspective. What are the players and coaches saying? Yeah, we've had a chance to talk to some, and I think what I've noticed is a sense of professional pride that has kicked in. Uh, did you end up watching Last Dance, uh, the Michael Jordan documentary at all? I, I saw a few episodes, not the entire, yeah. So one of the episodes early on, they showed a heated scrimmage of the Dream Team. There were no fans in attendance. It was in a closed gym. 
and it was this incredible footage of Charles Barkley going against Carl Malone and David Robinson and Jordan and Magic talking smack. And that is what struck me in my preparation for this NBA restart and then for the reality of watching it both remotely and now in person. Mm -hmm. It's professional pride. Mm -hmm. when, when the ball is tossed in the air and you're counting the points, you're keeping score, most of the players realize that this counts. Yeah. And at the end of the day, when they decide who won and who lost, it's going to mean something to them. So the intensity level to me was very high. Mm -hmm. What you did catch was more communication between the players and coaches because yeah. they could really hear one another mm -hmm. and players on the bench pumping up their teammates mm -hmm. after a big play. Yeah. And normally we would see that. We would see bench celebrations. But the difference was you could actually hear somebody. Right. right. And I think that's going to bond these guys together. Look, mm -hmm. every team is saying the same thing, Joe. When asked about the experience, coaches, players are saying, yeah, we're, we're really close and we're doing all this stuff together and we're eating all our meals together and we're going bowling, we're going fishing, and we're hanging out. All of that is great until you actually play the game. Right. And there are a lot of teams that think they have a great chemistry and they go 0-8 during right. these eight games. So the wins and losses are going to determine a lot of our final conclusions mm -hmm. of who handled this well. But in terms of just the pure competition, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I think these guys are into it. Uh, thinking of the now the fan experience, um, you've been in arenas and stadiums all across this country. Um, yep. I've been trying to catch up with you at Heinz Field for the past few years. One day, it, one day. It, it is quite an experience as yep. a fan walking into an arena with my other tribe members. Yep with my colors on and the flags waving. Um, and now all of that sort of goes away. I mean, how, how, do you, what's the question here is, is are you hearing conversations uh, from um, sport ownership, from uh, league managers about how to create a new fan experience going forward? Joe, as you well know, it's visceral. But it's, it's something that you can feel mm -hmm. in your bones, and you can't simulate that. It's still exciting. You watch the Lakers and the Clippers. You were into it. You were engaged. You were reacting. Maybe you, you were even emoting at times when LeBron makes a huge play and you pop out of your seat for a moment. Mm -hmm. But it's still not the same. Right. I got no not one to same. high five. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's not. You can virtual high five. Yeah. You could send your <laughs> friend a text. You could check in with your daughter. You, uh, you can still have moments and shared moments, but it's not the same. There's no embrace. There's no look. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no nod of affirmation that you get from being at a live sporting event. The NBA has created this virtual fan experience and. You know, it, it was cool. I, I thought the fact that you had fans there in, in some way, shape, or form brought a little something to the table, but it's not going to replace it. Right. There's no way to do that. The owners are concerned, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. uh, financially, yeah. first and foremost. And how do you develop new fans? Right. Well, you develop them through everything that you just laid out. Mm -hmm. The feeling of being a part of something, mm -hmm. the, the feeling of commonality, and no matter how different you might be as people, for this team and this game and this moment, you come together and you rejoice uh, because you have that shared experience. Mm -hmm. I, I think most people are just happy that it's back right. in some form, and then eventually the other part has to, to fill the void. Right. And the hope is, whether it is a virus, uh, whether uh, it is a vaccine that finally comes and, and saves the day, I, I don't think it's going to be as simple as just that happening. It's yeah. still going to take a long time. If yeah, anything, I, I you'll, you'll, see, you'll see uh, owners maybe accepting half capacity, a third right. capacity. It's going to be a buildup. Yeah, and, and, and I can't imagine everyone being comfortable going back in, into that environment no. from a fan's perspective. So Understandably. 
So I wonder, you know, what new methods of access there there will be uh, for fans. Um, I'm thinking of um, you know paywall streaming uh, through yep. the team's website. Uh, maybe there is something in movie theaters where you can manage the capacity. Maybe there's something in with drive-through um, uh, drive-in theaters. I don't know. Yep. I'm just trying to think of how how we move forward, um, giving as many fans access as as much as possible beyond, um, you know, the television broadcasts are great, but they're, you're only going to have one game in the market uh, or whatever market's close to you. Maybe you can get the NFL ticket, but mm-hmm. it seems like other methods of access have to be developed uh, if you want to capture that revenue and give, uh, give, give your fans access to, to the team. Yeah, I think you're going down the right path. And I think uh, that's what many marketing people within the individual leagues are trying to, to sort out. What we've seen, I'd say over the last five years, more accelerated, but we did see it seven to 10 years ago. A lot of teams have brought a, a lot of the production in-house and they tell their fans, we can get you closer to the action, Mm -hmm. even more so than the networks or the affiliates or the websites. You come to us. You're a Steelers fan. You come to Steelers.com, and we're going to have the latest news. We're going to have one-on-one interviews. We're going to have all-access, behind-the-scenes footage that you can't get anywhere else. I will imagine that that's what teams will look to do, but – you know, based on the circumstances currently within the confines of these uh, different buildings around the NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball, and the NHL, we're not there yet. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're just not at a point where we could even consider doing that. That's, that's in the future, and right now their goal is to just get the games going and provide fans with entertainment and something that uh, can fill that empty space. Uh, Before I let you go, one last question. Presumably you'll be covering NFL for CBS. Yes. Um, What are you guys talking about? How how will that move forward? Um, Not only the broadcast, but uh, is there any idea of what the stadium experience is going to be like? Very fluid right now. Uh, I think the NFL is working through a a lot of different possibilities, Joe. They had the benefit of time, unlike any other sport. Mm -hmm. All of this happened very early in their offseason, and they continued business as usual. NFL draft was different, more intimate, was not the big event that they normally put on with 100,000 people Mm -hmm in the streets of whatever city they've chosen that year, Nashville or Philadelphia or Chicago. And I actually liked it. I thought, I thought it really came across well. It gave us a taste mm-hmm. behind the scenes of yeah. the players that were realizing a dream and their families. And then we got to see decision makers mm-hmm. and coaches and their families. It was really cool. And it yeah. might be something that they consider moving forward as uh, the standard in which they do that particular event. But with that said, here we are. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're hitting August. Right. And the clock has accelerated. It's mm-hmm. ticking. And right now we still don't exactly know what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. I think the NFL's hope was that by the time they hit September, things around the country would be better and we would be back to quasi-normal. Right. We're not. And we're dealing with we're dealing with multiple states that have varying degrees of uh, of impact and and how their um, uh, in, infection rates. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. But uh, you know, things, man, times are changing, and uh, we're we're along for the ride, and we'll see how it how it does. But Ian, I uh, want to thank you very much for classing up pop life for me. Uh, I appreciate it. It's always good to talk to you, man. When, yes, sir. When, when's your next game? I've got uh, Nets and Wizards on Sunday and then Portland and Houston on Tuesday night. Okay. Well, best so, of luck. I'll be, I'll be tuning in. Man, it's great to be back. Uh, it was 
very different, very unique being there in person and not having the stimuli that you're accustomed to, but it still was the NBA and I felt that and hopefully the fans enjoyed it. Uh, to me, the NBA knows what they're doing. They, they know how to put on an event and that's how they're treating us. Honestly, I think we're so thirsty. We we take some little leaves. <laughs> <on it. laughs> right, pick up <laughs> pick up basketball <laughs> down at the Y. I think league. so. <laughs> hey man, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, Joe, love talking to you. We'll do it again.